Hello Hillside, great to see you guys today. Uh, hope you guys are ready to worship and to hear the word. We got an awesome service for you guys, so grab a cup of coffee, get comfy, and let's get going. Thank you, Reuben. We're ready to celebrate and give thanks to the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For He's good. Sing praise, sing praise, with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, His love endures forever, for the life that's been reborn, His love endures forever, we sing praise. the victory he moves every mountain and what Satan meant for evil God can turn for good if you need a victory today this morning this song is for you it's a new song no weapon that may form won't prosper when the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Cause the God I serve only knows how to triumph. My God will never fail. My God will never fail. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Every war he wages, he will win. 
I'm not backing down from any giant I know how this story ends Yes, I know how this story ends I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good Yes, you turn it for good You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good Yes, you turn it for good You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good Yes, you turn it for good
Dear God, we just thank you so much, uh, God, this morning for just the opportunity that we have, no matter where we are, to come together in prayer, God, to come together in worship, bringing just you glory, honor, and praise, the honor and praise that is due. God, we thank you that we have the opportunity, uh, even though we are separated because of uh, social distancing and, and, and mandates where we're not able to meet in person. God, we thank you that we have the opportunity to still gather together as a body of Christ uh, at our homes, through Facebook, through YouTube. God, we just thank you for these opportunities. God, we pray that this morning, uh, God, as we've spent some time in worship, as we're spending some time in prayer now, and as we're going to spend some time in your word after this, God, we just pray that in all things, God, you be made uh, high, God, that, that, that your name be lifted high, God, that you be glorified in our midst. God, we humble ourselves. We come boldly bef before your throne. And God, we pray on behalf of the church. We pray for uh, the families within the church. God, we pray for our state. We pray for our nation. God, we lift up uh, the Lundgrens and the Cox family this, this morning, God, as, as they have had loss in their family, as, as a dear saint has gone home. God, we just pray that you would, uh, God, just comfort beyond anything God, we could ask or imagine. God, we just thank you for uh, this amazing family, a part of our fellowship. And so, God, we just pray that you would lift them up. God, we pray for those who are hurting, those who are in need, those who have been affected by this pandemic and, 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 and the socioeconomical things that have come as a result. God, we just pray for your healing, your restoration, and God, for you to make things whole. God, we pray that as we're in a time of turmoil in our nation, uh, God, that you would just bring peace. God, that there would be justice, that there would be righteousness. God, we pray that you would, God, appoint. We know that your word tells us you put those in power who are in leadership, God. And we pray that, that there would be righteousness, God, in all the offices. Uh, God, that, that there would be uh, just a sense of, of moving forward uh, these Judeo-Christian values. And so, God, we just pray and we, and we align ourselves biblically. God, help us for the times where we have our own pride that comes in and, 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 and we uh, want to stand up for what seems best. God, we want what is your best. And so, God, I pray that you would just inspire us and encourage us in all those areas. God, for the church, uh, God, as, as we are still under construction here in the physical building, God, we pray that you would uh, help with all of that. Uh, God, give us favor with all of that. Uh, God, and as we look forward to the day where we're able to meet in person, God, I pray that there would be a stir and an excitement in our hearts. So God, we just thank you for these things. And God, we praise you in your son's wonderful and beautiful name, Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Well, hey, Hillside, if we haven't met yet, my name is Matt. I'm one of the pastors here at Hillside. And uh, I have an announcement. I made the announcement at our drive-in worship service last week. I, and you've probably seen it on Facebook if we're friends. But Mariah, my wife, uh, and I, we have uh, a new addition to our family. Our little daughter, Charlotte Elaine, was born on October 7th. And we really look forward to introducing her to all of you in the weeks to come. So just continue to be praying for us. I, I say that almost selfishly, but be praying for us as we're learning this new parenting thing. Pray for health uh, for, for our little baby baby, and we're just super excited about that. We have a couple announcements, some highlights that we want to share with you uh, wherever you're at watching this. First and foremost is we are looking to get back together to meet in person here in this building, the Sunnyside Campus, formerly known as the Damascus Campus, here in the Sunnyside Campus, starting on November 8th. Now that's going to be subject to change based off of construction and all those kind of things, but tentatively mark your calendar for November 8th as we are looking to do in-person live services. We're going to have two services. We're going to have a 9 o'clock and we're going to have an 11 o'clock. There's going to be sign-ups, there's going to be CDC requirements, social distancing, face mask, all that kind of stuff. I know sometimes it's not fun, but hey, let's sacrifice the funness of that so that we can come together and have church in person. Amen? 
I, I, I believe you're saying amen at home as well. Just a few couple other announcements. Make sure you get connected with us on Facebook. Make sure you're connected with us on Instagram. Make sure you're connected with us on our text in church because we have a lot of little activities going on that we want you to stay up to speed on. Some great opportunities to get connected, come together for prayer, have life groups, youth. There's some things coming up, just some amazing things. Make sure you stay connected on those. And so I'm sure we'll put some sort of link here in the description on how to get connected there. And the last thing is giving. We as a church, we believe in being generous. We believe in giving biblically. Biblically, that means we give in the tithe. It's the first 10% of our increase. It's, it's the first 10% of what we receive, we give back to the Lord because at the end of the day, it's all his. And so we are just honoring what he has commanded us and we are obeying what he has instructed us in scripture, giving back the tithe. But we also believe in giving above and beyond the tithe. We want to be a generous church, a church that gives hilariously, where people on the outside, they look and they say, those guys are crazy because they're just giving money to needs. Well, here's the reality. We live in a world where there are so many needs and we as the church, it is our mission and it is our mandate to help in these areas, to bring true social justice, social justice that has the gospel attached to it and that requires finances. And so we give in alms. It's those monies that come in so that we can help those in our community who are less fortunate. We are connected with so many great organizations and we as a church, we have started many great organizations and there's opportunities to stay connected and giving in alms. And we also believe in the Great Commission and that's the gospel going forth, not only here in our city, in our state and in our nation, but across the world to the ends of the world. And we as a church, we support over 30 missionaries and this is a great opportunity for us to come together to really stretch ourselves, to step out in faith, to give above and beyond the tithe, to give in missions. So we wanna encourage you, let's be a generous church, let's be a faithful church, and let's give with a cheerful heart, amen? Well, hey, Pastor Dave's gonna grab his Bible, he's gonna grab his coffee, so I hope you do the same. Hunker in as we're gonna continue our study in the book of Acts with these God-sized uh, operations, amen. Hey, good morning, Hillside. Pastor Dave here, in case we haven't met. I just want you to know how much we love and appreciate everyone who's part of our fellowship and those who are joining in online and our online platforms. We welcome you, we encourage you, and we want you to be a part of even our online family. And if when we open our doors, hopefully on November 8th, uh, that you might come and join us and uh, be a part of our uh, fellowship in person. And so we're looking forward to those days. Uh, huge thanks to Pastor Matt and uh, our worship team leading us in worship this morning and prayer. And uh, we're diving into our study again in the book of Acts. We're in Acts chapter 12. So if you want to grab your Bibles and uh, flip open to Acts chapter 12, uh, we'll begin in just a moment. Uh, and while you're doing that, we are in our current series called God-Sized Operations. God-Sized Operations. And this is really, this is really the third message. It's part two of the third message, and that is uh, uh, God-sized uh, or extraordinary operations or extra or, uh, extraordinary ops is what I'm trying to say. Uh, extraordinary ops. And so we're looking at verses 1 through 19 this morning. And, uh, but before we get started, I wanted to remind us about a couple of scriptures and a couple of stories in the Old Testament because we really are looking at some supernatural occurrences. And today, the main focus is, I, want, I believe that the Spirit of God is revealing something about the condition of the church and then an assignment for the church. And I don't want to alarm you, but I have five things to look at in terms of the condition of the church. And I have 12 things that you and I on a supernatural level need to be uh, about. So yes, that's like 17 points on this morning's sermon. So haha, buckle your seatbelt and let's get ready to roll. All right. So remember this, remember this. First John chapter four and verse four reminds us, reminds us that he that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. He that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. So thanks be to God, if your faith is in Jesus Christ today for the forgiveness of your sin, a supernatural transaction has occurred. God's Spirit has taken up residence inside you. The Spirit of God, God the Spirit. 
God is dwelling in you. You have become a partaker of the divine nature. Come on, that's epic. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The he that is in the world, it's the forces of evil. Satan is at the head. Some one-third of the angels of heaven, Revelation tells us, went in Satan's rebellion and they are fallen angels, and they are reaping havoc in the world. But be of good cheer. Jesus has overcome, and he has caused us to be more than overcomers. So thanks be to God for that. And, I, and I'm, reminded, I'm reminded of the story of Elisha, the prophet, in 2 Kings chapter 16. You see, there was an Assyrian army that encircled them entirely, and Elisha's servant went out and looked and saw the vast army. And he came in and he said to Elisha, he said, what are we to do? Well, hey, Romans chapter 8, verse 31, listen to this. What then shall we say in response to these things? Hey, no matter the army around us, what should we say in response to these things? If God be for us, then who can be against us? Come on. He's going to build his church, and the gates of hell will not be able to stand against it. Come on. We have the victory in Jesus. And it's not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And I believe that there's some intelligence, military intelligence, in our text today, but let me take you a little further in 2 Kings chapter 6. You see, he said, what are we to do about these things? Oh, my master, what are we to do? Maybe you felt that way before. You've looked at your circumstances, and you've cried out to God, oh, master, oh, Jesus, what am I to do? Well, the response, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. I cannot emphasize that as children of God, just like part one of the message last week, we talked about earnest prayer, the fervent, effectual prayer of a righteous man availeth much. We must be in earnest prayer. And secondly, like Peter, on the night before, he knew certain death. He was asleep. Shalom in perfect peace. We must let the peace of God rule and reign in our hearts. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. That's what, the, that's what the prophet said. And then he said these words, For those who are with us are more than those who are against us. And you, you know the rest of the story. He prayed that the eyes of the servant would be open, and as his eyes were open, he saw all around on the hill angels on chariots of fire. Come on, this is epic. Second Kings chapter nine, er, Second Kings, that was Second Chronicles chapter six. Second Kings chapter 19 tells us in detail what transpired, and there was earnest prayer that night, and Hezekiah the king no, nope, that's a different story. Uh, it, th there was earnest prayer that uh, the eyes would be opened, and his eyes were opened, and again, there was more with us and against. Let me tell you the next story. The next story is absolutely radical. Second Chronicles chapter 32 verses. 7 and 8. Second Chronicles chapter 32 is the story of Hezekiah and is the story of Sennacherib. Sennacherib, the Assyrian king, he had besieged the city. Jerusalem is besieged and all kinds of things are happening and Hezekiah prays earnestly, a humble prayer, and he calls for Isaiah, the son of Amos, and Isaiah sends word back to him that he is going to fight the battle. It's fascinating, but listen to what it says in verse 7. It says, be strong and courageous, and again, do not be afraid or discouraged because of the king of Assyria. Listen, I want you to understand something. One of the names of Satan He's got like 33 different names or idioms in the Old Testament, and one of those is the Assyrian. 
So in typology, you can know that this is like the children of Israel or the children of God being attacked by the devil, the Assyrian. He says, do not be afraid or discouraged. Praise God. Why? Because we can be strong and courageous because, it says, uh, he goes on to say, do not be discouraged before the king of Assyria and the vast army with him, right? Third of the angels, vast army with him. For there is one, there is a greater one with us than with him. A greater one with us than with him. For with him is only an arm of the flesh. He's powerless unless we cooperate with him. But with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. Hey, praise be to God. There are multiple upon multiple upon multiple sermons in what I've just shared as a prelude to where we're going to be in Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12. And I'd like to pick up in Acts chapter 12, and I want to read verses 1 through 19, but I'm probably going to commentate as I go, so we'll see how far we get. Uh, but it says this, now about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. Now, this, this particular Herod, uh, this was Herod Agrippa I, the grandson of Herod the Great. His father was Aristobulus. He was one of the sons who was murdered by Herod the Great. He is the nephew of Herod Antipas, the one who ordered the death of John the Baptist. And he's the father of Herod Agrippa II, in which Paul, in chapter 26, makes his appeal. And so, he is a descendant of the Maccabees by his mother, educated in Rome, had a good relationship with the Jews in his attempt to keep the Jews on his side he makes decisions that violate, and that's part of what the tail end or the third point of last week's message, and I talked about the home plate in baseball being 17 inches, and he was influenced by the people. The fear of man will prove to be a snare, and as a people pleaser, he stretched out home plate. He widened home plate. He changed. And you and I, this is our rule of faith and conduct. This is our home plate. This is our 17 inches. Well, this Herod, this Herod, it says... He, to harass some or certain from the church. This was the leaders of the church. So here's the thing. It's a military intelligence that our adversary, the devil, roaming around, roaring like a lion, seeking whom he may devour, we can know that he is assaulting the leads of the church. Certain of the church were the leaders, James being one of them. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. Now this, this brother of John delineates who James is. And just by way of reminder, there are at least three James. James, the son of Alphaeus, that's not this one. James, the brother of Jesus, that's not this one. This is James, the brother of John. They're also known as the sons of thunder. You remember in, in, the, in the Gospels, it was James and John's mother who came to Jesus and said, hey, when you come into your kingdom, can, I, can my boy sit on your right and your left? And Jesus said, can you drink of the cup that I am going to drink? And the boys responded, yes. And he said, you will. Well, this is a fulfillment of Jesus' prophecy in relationship to James. He drank the cup. He was beheaded with a sword. And so, G Jesus later said, or in that conversation, he says, it's not for me to determine who is going to sit on either side of me at that time, but this is who we are referring to. And so James was put to death. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. And now it was during the days of unleavened bread. So this festival of Passover, the Passover, then festival of unleavened bread, of which at the beginning of that will be the Feast of First Fruits. It's going to have to come to its end before Herod brings death again. But Peter is going to be confiscated and put in and under guard. It says, Peter, so when he had arrested him, verse 4, 
he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers. It's a quintirian, a quintirian. It's, it's four soldiers, four groups of four, so 16 soldiers, uh, to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God, or earnest prayer was offered to God for himself by the church. And when Herod was about to bring him out that night, Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers, and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. Now, five observations. Peter, a representation of the church. I believe unequivocally that these five observations would be observations of today the condition of the church of Jesus Christ, which you and I are a part of. So we have to self-examine to see if these are not also descriptive of perhaps where we are in our walk with the Lord and in our part in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the first, it says this. He was put in prison, verse 4. Peter, therefore, kept in prison. Captive. Captive. Captive can be a number of things. It could be held, but it can also be I'm captive or captivated by some other thing. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added unto you. We can evaluate our lives and say, am I seeking first the kingdom of God? Or am I captive in another place? Am I captivated by some, am I allured some other way, some other thing, positionally in another place, mentally in another place, at a soul level, emotionally in another place, physically in another place. Folks, kept in prison are we captive by the one who is in the world? Okay, the second observation, threatened. We are in a threatened state. The evil one has come but to kill, steal, and destroy. That is a death threat on your life and on my life. He has come to destroy everything in your life and you and everything you hold near and dear. Listen, when Ben Hadad in the Old Testament came to Ahab, he said, give me all your wives and your children and your silver and your gold. And Ahab's like, all right. And then he said, oh, the king said, all right, great. Tomorrow we're going to come and we're going to go through your house and everything that is dear to you will be ours. That's what the enemy wants to do. He wants to take and destroy everything that is near and dear to you. That's a threat. It's a threat. And the threat was that Herod was going to bring Peter out and take his life. That's what the enemy wants to do. He wants to take you out. He wants to take you out. Third condition. Now, I'm going to say what this is, and then I'm going to have to recap from last week. But Peter was asleep. Now, last week, I likened that unto the place of being at peace. Today, I want to use that understanding of just asleep that the church is in a lulled state. We're asleep. We're, we're, we're unwise. We're uncertain of the times that we are living in. Do we realize that Jesus Christ is coming soon? Jesus is coming soon. 
We must be about our Father's business. And what are we doing? Seems like so often the church is just spinning its wheels. The churches in any given community are not collaborative together with a vision and a mission of how to reach every house, every home, every man, woman, and child with a clear presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh God, help us and wake up the church. We talk about revival. Folks, we need an awakening before we can have a revival. We need an awakening. I guess they might be one and the same, but at the end of the day, the church needs to get up Get up. What about you? Are you awake? Are your eyes open? Is your head up? We must have our eyes fixed upon Jesus. Listen, I, I love, you know, when you walk in uh, to the Sistine Chapel in Rome, you cannot help but do this. And you'll begin to do this. And for As long as you're in that chapel area, your head will be looking up. And I believe that that is the state that the church needs to be in. We must have our eyes up looking to the Lord, looking toward heaven. The Bible says, look up for redemption draweth nigh. Jesus is coming soon. We must be awake. Okay, number four, bound. Bound. It says... He was in bondage with shackles, fetters, chains between two common soldiers, two guards. And and that prison, by the way, is a dark place. That prison, by the way, is uh, it's a closed room made of stone with a door that's solid. Kept in prison and he's in bondage. Listen, we may be captivated and some of the things that are captivating us may in fact be a bondage for us. Are you bound by something? Are you bound maybe by some sin? Are you bound by some fetter that's holding you fast? Look, God wants to cut the cords that hold men fast to sin. Oh Lord, set us free. Hey, he has, but the church remains with the chains upon them. Bondage. And then the fifth is, I would say, in a state of watched and guarded. And why do I say that? Because the text tells us this. It says, he was kept in prison. Then it says, uh, he was bound with two chains which I would say the bondages in the lives of the followers of Christ today in the church may be multiple, may be multiple, may not be just one, it may be many, many forms of bondage. Okay, two chains between two soldiers and the guards before the door, right? So he's, he's bound by two men who are, certainly keeping him, then he's being watched by others who, if something happens here, they can step in and ensure that there's no freedom. There is, I I would call it oppression. There is an oppression on the church by the forces of the evil one. We've forgotten the greater is he that is in us. We have forgotten that the battle is the Lord. We have forgotten that we're not to be afraid. We, are, we have forgotten to take courage, be of good cheer. We have forgotten all of those thoughts. Listen, what did Moses tell the children of Israel when they turned around at the Red Sea and they saw Pharaoh and all of his army and the chariots coming after him? He said these words, do not be afraid, stand firm, and you will see the Lord's salvation for which Uh, He says, which he will accomplish for you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. We got to realize. He said, I have given you authority to trample upon snakes and scorpions and all of the power of the evil one 
nothing shall harm you. Come on. These five states of the church today, we got to shake that stuff off. We got to break that stuff out. We got to, in the power of his might, say, no, I'm going to live according to the promises that Jesus has apprehended for us. Jesus has apprehended them. In him, all of the promises of God are yes and amen. So what's our response? Now, this is those five. Now, what's our response? Watch. This is, I believe this is powerful. Okay. Listen, I'm going to read the text a little further. And let's pick up what the church's response is. Watch what Peter does. It says this. Herod, verse 6, was about to bring him out. That night, Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains, between two soldiers, and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. Now behold, now behold is an epic phrase, idu in the Greek, idu in the Greek. And it, it's used very, very specifically at the end of a narrative. And it's introducing something that is like, see this? Boom! It's introducing something new, dynamic, and, if I could use this word, epic in proportion. Lo, see, behold. Now, see, now, behold, look. Yes, all of that stuff. Terrible, terrible situation. This narrative of Peter, he's going to die. But, behold, but God. And this is a but God statement. And what I love about this is it's used in introducing something. And what it's introducing is both unexpected yet certain, and it is impossible yet occurs. Unexpected, yet certain, impossible, yet occurs. Folks, no matter where you are, no matter even the, even the state of the church, listen, I believe the unexpectable certainty and the impossible will occur in your life and in my life. Let's apply what Peter does. Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him. The angel, this, this, this word stood by, it, 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 it's, it's, like, um, it's like he was standing there, but now he has presented himself. He's it's like the veil has been opened up to now he's visibly seen. He's been there, but now he's visibly seen. He's presented himself. And it says, the angel stood by him, and a light shone in the prison. And he struck Peter on the side. First point of the 12, be awakened. If you've been lulled, in prison, kept, all those five conditions, be awakened. Feel the striking of the Lord. God, God might be slapping you right now, and I mean slapping you in a good way, not across the chops, but he's hitting you in the arm. He's nudging you. He's giving you the shove. He's cattle prodding you, the spiritual oomph of God. It's an unction, and he's waking you up. Be awakened. We must be awakened. And he goes on to say, and he struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, arise quickly. We must be standing. Get up. we got to get up. Get off the ground. Get off the seat. Get the lead out. Get up. So be awakened. Be standing. And watch what happens. And Verse 7 goes on to say, his chains fell off his hands. Be loosed. 
whatsoever we loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven and we have been set free. We have been loosed. The power of the evil one is not over us. We have diplomatic immunity. We are citizens of heaven. We are Christ's ambassadors representing him. You and I, we have diplomatic immunity from the power of the evil one. All of the power of the evil one. Let's walk in that. Be loose. Those chains are powerless. They cannot hold you down. They cannot hold you back. They cannot hold you in something. You have been set free. You are loosed. Praise be to God. Now, the angel goes on to say, verse 8, the angel said to him, gird yourself. I want to tell you something. We need to be poised. The church of Jesus Christ, the living God, we must be poised and ready. Ready yourself. Get ready. Come on. Something's coming. It's almost as like the story in the Old Testament. He said, when you hear the sound of the angels marching on top of the mulberry trees, (laughs) get ready. Get ready. Man, the church We must be ready for the work of the Lord. Be poised. Listen, I played football a lot of years of my life, and I coached football a lot of years of my life, probably 24 years total included in my playtime and my coach time. And I want you to know something. There's something about being poised. And we tell our, we, I would tell the players, the old line, look, you got to be poised. You got to be ready. It, 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 the play doesn't start when you get to the line of scrimmage and put your fingers down on the ground and in your, in your stance. The play starts when you're in the huddle. You have a poised position in the huddle, man. You are ready to go. Hands on your knees, looking at your quarterback, and you are positioned. And man, when he says ready break, you turn and you run to the line of scrimmage like you own that land. They say there's a neutral zone. There's no neutral zone in football. Man, the O-line owns that territory. We own that land. Listen, we have two advantages on the offense, and we're in the offense. Two advantages in offense on the football. We know the cadence. And we know where the ball's going. And gang, we aren't going to give any of those up. We know the cadence. We know the count. When our our QB says go, man, we snap the ball and we're already in motion. And I always would coach the center and I said, look, the snapping of the ball has three motions. You're stepping with your foot as you're snapping the ball and you're popping your hand up to catch someone on the shoulder pad as they're starting to make their movement. But you're owning the zone. And that is the deal. Guys, we must be poised. I might get a little excited here. Okay. He says, gird yourself. And then he says, and tie your sandals. We got to cinch it up, man. It's time to cinch it up. In your life, what loose ends do you have? What things are you letting go by? You look down and you see your shoelaces untied and you keep walking. No, it's time not only to tie your shoes, but to cinch them up. I remember when my son's started wearing skateboard shoes when they were young kids and they wanted to leave the laces all super, super loose. And I can remember as a dad saying, hey man, cinch those shoelaces up. And they're like, no dad, that's, it's cool this way or whatever they were saying. Or maybe there was just, a, that was their form of rebellion. <laughs> dad wanted them to have their shoes tied tight. And they're like, uh, can we wear them loose, dad? Come on. Anyway, look folks, church, brothers and sisters, we got to cinch up, tie up our loose ends. I said recently to, some, to, to a group, I said, look, when, when I put my work boots on, literally, I tie the shoelaces, but what I do is I, I, I lace them all the way up, and then I have, I, I don't know what you call them, but they crisscross, and they have little uh, hooks, and you get them around the hook, get them around the hook, and I do that three times, and then I wrap them around my ankle twice, tie a knot, then I double tie the knot. The reason I do that is if I'm working in mud, if I'm working in concrete, if I'm working in dirt, and my shoelace isn't tied up and cinched up, and it comes untied, man, I gotta stop the work to tie my shoe. I gotta, and most often, it's goopy and group, and I gotta take my gloves off, get down there, tie the shoe, and it doesn't work. Look, we gotta be ready, poised, and we got to cinch everything up, man. We want no loose ends. We don't want anything that's going to hinder me, right? Just like the author of Hebrews says, let us lay aside every weight that so easily besets us. If we don't have things cinched up in our life, they're besetting. They'll slow you down. They'll trip you up. And we can't afford to do that. 
Jesus is coming soon. Get it cinched up. Let's go. Okay, so be awake, be standing, be loosed, be poised, be cinched. Now, then he says this. Go a little further. In verse 8, he says, And so he did, so Peter did those things, and the angel said to him, Put on your garment. Put on your garment. Now, this is an outer garment. Now, he's girded his loins, he cinched up his shoes, and he says, Put on your garment. Well, the scripture says to us, put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. We got to put on the garments that God provides for us. Number one, we got to put off the old, put on the new. We got to put on the clothing of Christ. It's the righteousness of Christ that we wear. We got to put on the garment of praise. We got to put on the armor of God. We got to be armed. So be armed. Number six, be armed. Be armored. Helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness, belt of truth, shoes, feet fitted with the readiness of the gospel of peace. I take up the shield of faith with which I can extinguish all of the fiery darts of the evil one. Ye wield the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions. Gang, we must have our armor on 24-7, 365. Be armed. Number seven. He said this. Put on your garment and follow me. Be following. By the way, these are the be attitudes, if you will, of the, the, the combating of the five conditions of the church. These are the things that we're to be, and we're to be following. Be a follower. Follow closely. Be in step and in stride with the Spirit of God. Don't get ahead of God. Don't lag behind. Be in step, in stride. He said, follow me. So, verse 9, he went out and followed him. Hallelujah. He did not know what was done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they were past the first and the second guard post, which, by the way, when I said that we are being watched, number five, the condition of the church, there are like five levels. He was chained to some guards there were guards at the door. Then there was the first guard, second guard, and an iron gate. That's a lot of kind of protective stuff that the enemy's trying to keep the church bound by. But we do not have to be bound. So Peter is now being let out. It says, uh, verse 10, when they were past the first and the second guard posts, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city. Listen, which opened to them of its own accord. <laughs> An inanimate object, non-replicating element made gate opened on its own accord. How'd it do that? That is an extraordinary operation. God will move on our behalf. He will move mountains. He will open doors that no man can shut. And he will shut doors that no man can open. Come on, this is the living God. And he will fight our battles. He will lead our way. He will open doors. He will set the course. And we will see the victory. Okay, so let's, following close, then it, it goes on to say, uh, they came to the iron gate, which leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord, and they went out and went down one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. And when Peter had come to himself, he said, now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me. Be delivered. Be delivered. Listen, be Earlier I said, be loosed, now be freed. You can be loosed and stay standing in the prison. You don't need to stay there. Get out. Get out. You've been freed. You're a free man in Christ. You are Christ's freed men. And let's get out and get out there. Hallelujah. So be freed. Now I love this. Verse 11, it says, and when Peter had come to himself, you guys, we got to be alert. We got to be, we, we got we to gotta be processing, looking at things. It says, uh, 
he came to himself and he said, now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel. He's processing. There's an alertness. I'm awake. It's not a vision. This, what is happening is real. And what I'm referring to is real. God will move in your life and in my life as he moved in Peter's, as he moved in Jesus's, as he moved in the story I just spoke about Moses, in the story I spoke about Hezekiah and Isaiah, as I spoke about Elisha and his servant. God, it's the same God. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hallelujah. Come on, this is good stuff. Be alert. And I want to say, be believing. For it says, now I know for certain. So he had come to himself. There's an alertness. Now I know for certain. Let's believe the word of God. Believe the word of God. Not mental assent. We've got to get it down here. The greatest distance on the, in the universe is 18 inches between one's head and one's heart. We've got to move beyond mental assent to belief and from belief to conviction. I am convinced, I'm certain that the Lord has brought this deliverance. Okay, we're almost to the end. Now let's go a little further in the text. The Lord has delivered me. So, verse 12. So, when he had considered this, again, at alertness, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where, again, many were gathered together praying. Last week's message. And as Peter knocked at the door. Now, I, want you, I just want you to get this contextually. Uh, he's knocking at a door, and he's literally knocking at a door. It's a, it's a walled uh, compound, if you will, with a house inside, Mary's house, uh, and, and there's a gate, and it's a solid gate, and he's knocking on the door. But what I want you to be thinking about is what Jesus said to you and I, and to all of his believers and all of his disciples. He said, ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. I, I, we need to be knocking on heaven's door church, we need to be knocking on heaven's door. We need to knock, 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 knock. I love that on the other side of the door, they know who's knocking. Not everybody knew. Not everybody knew, but in our case, when we're knocking, heaven knows who's knocking on the door. You and I, let's knock. And here, watch what happens. It says this, when uh, it says, uh, and as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, verse 13, a girl named Rhoda came to answer. When she recognized Peter's voice, hey, heaven is going to recognize your voice. I love that. Recognize your voice. Because uh, of her gladness, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter stood before the gate. But they said, you're beside yourself. Are you crazy? Yet she kept insisting that it was so. I love that also. There's just in it a persistence and insistence. And that's what Peter does. Watch what happens. Verse 16. Uh, they said it was his angel. Now Peter continued knocking. Has heaven been quiet? We gotta keep knocking. Persistent, tenacious, believing. Peter kept knocking. And when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. We gotta be knocking, and we gotta be knocking continually, and we gotta be knocking persistently on heaven's door. That's number 11. Number 12. Watch what Peter does. Door is opened, and when it was opened, and they saw him, they were astonished, overjoyed, I'm sure, elated, celebrated. I guess there might be 13 points. We gotta celebrate one another. We gotta celebrate our brothers and sisters. When a prodigal comes home, we don't have to ask him what he's been up to, why are you doing all that stuff. We don't have to drill him. We don't have to do any of that kind of stuff. We celebrate him. 
We embrace him. We run towards him. We throw our arms around him. We put the ring on his fingers. We put the good shoes on his feet and we kill the fatted calf and we say, praise God. My son, the, our brother that was lost has been found. Come on, that's celebratory. And they, they, they were astonished. And it says, but motioning to them with his hand to keep silent, he declared, he declared to them how the Lord had brought him out of prison. In the church, we need to be declaring to one another the victories of the Lord in our lives. We need to be telling the stories of the Word of God like I told you the story of Moses, as I told you the story of Hezekiah, as I told you the story of Elisha. We must recount the exploits of the Lord right up into this current day, what God is doing right now, his deliverances, his power being made manifest in your life and in my life, we must declare. And we must declare the gospel. God's salvation. God saved Peter from certain death. Peter was a dead man and yet he lives. Listen, you were once dead in your trespasses and sin, and yet you live. Christ has brought life to you. And we must convey the gospel. And with that, if you are watching today and you have not received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we, we cry out to you, be born again. Receive the grace of God in Jesus. Christ died for you. And he has made possible for you to be rightly related with our Father in heaven, to have your sin debt canceled. The wages of sin is death, a death that we deserve, Christ took. He took death and died in your place and in mine. Receive the Lord. The Bible says if we confess Jesus, we shall be saved. If anyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 10, 13. The Bible says that confession is made with the mouth. We make Jesus Christ as Lord. We make confession. And belief is in the heart, believing that God the Father has raised him from the dead, that God has raised him from the dead. We shall be saved. Oh, we cry out to you and we, I use an old term, we beseech you. Do not harden your heart today. Receive Christ now. Make that declaration. Make the declaration with me. I confess I'm a sinner. Oh God, thank you for your plan of salvation. I receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. And I believe in my heart that God, you raised Christ from the dead. And I thank you for the forgiveness of my sin. I thank you, God, for the canceled debt that I owe. I thank you, God, for the gift of eternal life. And I thank you that my name is written in your book. Listen, and we pray that in Jesus' name. And if you prayed that prayer, we want to welcome you to the family of God. Thanks be to God. We welcome you. If you live in the Clackamas area, we encourage you to come and be a part of our fellowship. If you're living in some other area, let us help you find a church. You can contact us at info at hcfclackamas.org and we will find a church that is a Bible teaching church in the community that you live in and we'll help you get connected. Our desire is that you would grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so all those things being said, to the rest of the church, hey, the condition of the church is those fivefold dispositions and uh, the, from, from being uh, captivated, from being in a uh, threatened, asleep, bound and watched state, we can actually live in those 13 different dispositions. And I want to encourage you as a member of Hillside Christian Fellowship to walk in that newness and walk in the power of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The worship team is coming back. 
in just a few moments, and they're going to lead us in this final song. I just want to say a quick word of prayer, and they'll come back, and we'll uh, close with a worship song, and Pastor Dennis will close us in prayer. Father, in the name of your son Jesus, I thank you for this fellowship. I thank you for our body of believers, and I pray, God, that we would not be in those five states of the church, but we would be experiencing these other 13 scenarios, God, where we can be walking in the newness and life and freedom that, God, you have provided for us, poised and ready to go, fully armed and ready for the battle. Thank you, Lord, that your word declares, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. We need not be afraid, but be of great courage. The battle belongs to the Lord, and he will go out and fight our battles. Father, we thank you. In Jesus' mighty name, and all God's people said a strong amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. Amen.
What a great service we've had this morning, Hillside. We are so thankful that you are able to join us again this week. We look forward to seeing you again very, very, very soon in person. It's coming up, so be ready. Enjoy the week and tune back in next week for a great Sunday. God bless.